This is Take Flights with Mark Whittle. Welcome to the Take Flight Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me on. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> what a <laughs> space. At all. Like, at all. Came up to, so we're in the north of England. Yeah. Came up to the M1. Easy, actually. It's God's country. God's yeah. country. It's God's country. <laughs> Sun shines here all the time. Mate, it is blue skies <laughs> out here. And the, the land that you live on is unbelievable. Yeah. And I've got a nice welcome with the dog pissing on my bag. <laughs> I <laughs> know. I bet. Uh, well, when you pull through the gate, uh, a few, only a few people know. Like my ex-wife lives next door, and her mm. boyfriend's there. My daughter's there. And so I thought, just to get the ex- shock expression on your face. Yes, that's my ex-wife. That's her boyfriend. You're like, what the? But it's actually, it's actually a really good setup. Uh, yeah, we're getting really well. It's it a good. Feels it. It's calm. I yeah. actually, <clears throat> um, I had COVID uh, a few months ago. And uh, and it really knocked me back. I was in a bad way, and um, and I really appreciated having my family around. Mm. So even though my wife and myself aren't together, yeah. everybody they they looked out for me. Like the kids would come and leave food at the door. Debbie would come and leave food at my door. Um, I woke up one morning. My daughter would like come in with a mask on mm. four o'clock in the morning to check my temperature, Aww. and I actually felt I really appreciated having someone around. And then I thought, what about the people I haven't got people around? Especially yeah. times like now when yeah. <clears throat> when people are just trying to avoid everybody. I just appreciated the things I probably took for granted, and um, and uh, it's just it's just nice. It's nice. It's funny that we need that though, don't we? We need that shock or something. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say something bad to happen, but something to like a bit of a setback to yeah, realise. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it has actually made me look at things differently. Mm. And um, I just, <clears throat> it, it is really nice. Yeah. It is really nice. And I think when people come in and look from the outside in, they think, oh my God, how's that work? But it actually works really well. Mm. Um, and and it, I couldn't wish for anything better. Yeah. It's interesting because not this isn't a relationship podcast, but, <laughs> 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 you know, in the modern world, we are becoming more and more accepting of things like divorce and breakups and it is just a natural part of life. And a lot of people, I think, in the past stayed in relationships unhappy because you just feel like it's just not an option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my, and I've, done, I've actually spoke on podcasts about this thing and, and it's about the breakdown of, of relationships. And I think with, this, with the lockdown itself, it's probably made a lot of people realise they're living with somebody they don't want to live with mm. or, or appreciate what they've got. <clears throat> and and it's, it's understanding. If you're in a relationship and that relationship, the romance of that relationship has gone, you no longer love that person as though you, you first loved them then it, and you split. Of course, it's going to be a bit awkward and a bit uncomfortable because you've got to adjust a, a, a new norm mm. but you create your own norm and 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 Debbie and I uh when we split up um at first it was it was just it was hard uh, for both of us because it was but a lot of tension there was a lot of uh bad feeling and then I actually thought you know what actually we what, why are we like this you know if we, we we just don't want to be with each other but we've got kids together and and actually it's funny why would i say this on there it's funny but i uh, i apologized to her i said you know what? i'm sorry i'm sorry for not being the husband i should have been mm. i'm sorry for 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 changing this course of your life and it, it was a complete u-turn of how our relationship was because it wasn't to get back with it it's to actually acknowledge look you know, we, we, we've been good together. You know, we're not going to be together, but but I'm sorry for, for letting you down. And But we're still a family. Family's family no matter what. So, so and I said, hmm. you know, I want you to be happy. I want you to be with somebody. I want you to do something and vice versa. And it actually, it actually works so well. It actually, it, it's brilliant. And, uh, and I've, I'm, my boyfriend's a nice guy, and I think, please, Debbie, don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. He's a nice guy. <laughs> uh, we're just family, and uh, and once you can accept that, yeah. and once you can get your head around that part of it, especially guys, you've got to get your head around that part of it. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be any animosity, because you are you have created this unit, this family, and so just because you're not no longer romantically uh, entwined with that your partner it doesn't mean it have to be horrible yeah you just think you know what that's how it was we had a great time boom done we get on better now than we did when we were together hmm. and um and, and a lot i speak to a lot of guys about it i think look just park it yeah you know park park the wrongs park the rights you know think about what you've created together and think about creating your own your own norm this is normal for us uh and it works really well mm. i just speaking there like 
felt a little bit of resistance in myself. I think that that would be one of the biggest challenges because you're parking your ego. Yes, around, ego is the biggest enemy. Yeah. Biggest enemy. It's the biggest, the biggest downfall. An mm. ego in anything, in relationships, in jobs, in, in in especially sport. If you cannot control that ego, the ego will control you. And and it's great if you want to be a boxer and you want to be braggadocious, you want to learn everything. But in the real world. Unless you're a multi-millionaire, you've got money to say that to people, you don't have to answer to people, it can be your downfall. So something, once you get your ego in check, especially in the real world that's in relationships, your relationships can be so much better because you think, what is it? You know, mm. what, what difference does it make? Yeah. You know, you've just got to get yourself in check. You're yeah. no less of a man or no less of a woman, uh, but you've got to get your ego in check. Use common sense. Use, 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 use a, have a good heart. Have, think, think right. Think... Well, how would I want to be treated? Mm -hmm. And and I, I speak to a lot of guys. I can't. I, I don't know how women think, but I speak to a lot of guys, and I say, boys, sometimes if you mess up, own your shit. Yeah, own your shit. And say, you know what? I messed up there because you don't realize how much it actually is appreciated mm -hmm. by by your ex partner to say, you know, he's acknowledged where he's yeah. gone wrong, and we actually laugh and joke about it. And, uh, and, uh, and I think I gave him a phone once and she went, oh my God, you've never done this when we were married. And she just, <laughs> but we can laugh and joke about things because we know who we are, we know where we are. Yeah. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be that way, especially if you've got kids. Mm. And that's, that's like not hiding from your truth, isn't it? Because yeah. a lot of us just bury that stuff because we're either embarrassed or ashamed maybe yeah. as well. Or we, or we lie. Yeah. Or we lie and, 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 and live that lie. But, and it's just... People on the outside, when they see it, they struggle to comprehend it. Mm -hmm. But if you live it, when when my friends and people come and they see how we all interact, do you think, God, you know what? I wish I was like this with my ex. Mm -hmm. And it, it's cool. It's all right. It's, yeah. it's, we, 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 it should, I keep mixing the name up with my sister. And my sister, my, mixing my sister's name up with her because we are family. Yeah. You forget about what we were, but we look at what we've created. Mm. And so and this is how I look at it. I care for her. Like I care for my sister, I care for her because we're family. Yeah. And we spent most of our adult life with each other. So we know each other better than anybody. And it's just, it's probably hard for anybody else coming into your life. Yeah. And, and I probably feel for a boyfriend a little bit, but he's a, he's a nice guy. And I think, mm. please just, 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 just take the ride, man. Just hold on tight. You'll be all right here. Uh, but it's good. It's all right. So, so what have you created, Johnny? And what's, what's your, life look like what have you designed for yourself so you know whether you talk about the working week and your commitments with sky and other other things that you're doing in the media your training your, your lifestyle what what does your life look like well in boxing i i and it's it's well documented i fell on i i didn't i wasn't a natural fighter i this career found me more than anything else i was forced on that path uh, and you always find when you look in the news at, at sportsmen, ex-sportsmen, any sport, it, um, they struggle after they mm -hmm. finish their sport. And they struggle because you've got to be a different kind of beast. And I'm not saying we're superhuman. Or what's super, it's like probably being in the army. And it's wrong with me to compare it being in the army. But you've got to have a different kind of mindset when you're doing your sport. And so, and you've got to be selfish. You've got to think selfishly if you want to get to the very top. Mm -hmm. But that kind of mentality doesn't work in the real world. That selfishness doesn't work in the real world. So therefore, when you do that, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you when you do that, and uh, and it, it, when you get when you if you carry that ego uh, or you carry that attitude, what you had in the sport that got you to the top into the real world, it doesn't it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So so then you've got to adjust, and you always find out a lot of ex sportsmen and women after for the first five years when they retire from the sport. That's when the shit hits the fan. Yeah. Drink, drugs, whatever. You always hear that 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 rocky that rocky story. It's hard to adjust to civilian life. I know it sounds stupid, uh, and so you've got to create your own happiness. Now, for me, I wasn't Boston didn't even identify me. Mm -hmm. I I was I, to me I was like, I was I was in in a job and I'd, I'd, ex, I'd experienced the things I experienced, but I never thought I'm a boxer. I thought I'm boxing. I'm just mm -hmm. having to go to boxing. So when I sit around, I can remember going to, um, we were traveling somewhere. There was me, David Hay, Carl Froch, um, I think Matthew Macklin. And they were all talking about boxing when they represented the country and they traveled to Pakistan. And I'm like, sort of thinking, shit, I shouldn't be in this conversation here. And I actually felt as though I shouldn't be there. Even though I achieved everything I achieved, 
I, I actually, I never felt, I never thought I was one of them because I thought, you guys have done so well, oh my goodness. And it was like, I was fascinated like a fan. Even though I'd, I'd set a record of defence as a world champion, <laughs> I just looked at their pedigree and what they'd done. And so I, uh, so I, uh, to me, I wasn't identified by boxing. I knew I could live away from boxing, but I needed to find that something that worked for me, that gave me that itch, that, 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 uh, that, that, and I, still, I used to ride, I'd, I'd hunt, I'd, I'd do everything just to give me that rush. Yeah. Uh, then once I've, I'd sort of settled and, and got into my head, you're not a boxer anymore. That's not what you're doing for a living. Then it, it's an adaptable skill. The things you learn through boxing, in and out of the ring, you've got to adapt it to, to everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the experience I've had, the, 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 the experience I've been through, that wisdom that you've gained from other experiences, you pass it on. Like Brendan did with me, mm -hmm. I do with others. So I talk about... Brendan used to say that it's a thin line between success and failure. And when you, you haven't succeeded, when you're trying to succeed, you think it's a never-ending mountain to climb. You think, how am I going to do this? But when you succeed, you think, is that it? But you could never put it into words what it is and how it's done. But I could show you, but I couldn't tell you. So when you do it, you think, I remember when I became world champion, I thought, was that it? Was that it? And I knew I'd never, ever lose as world champion again because I understood what it was. It wasn't luck. You know, I understood. I'd, I'd been through all the knots, all the successes, all the failures. So I understood that is an adaptable skill. You can adapt that to family. You can adapt it to work. You can adapt it to relationships. You can adapt it to everything. I can't explain to you how it is. I can show you. And, and, and so when I try and get it down, I basically say, if you want it enough, you will get it. But think, be careful what you wish for. Mm. Be careful. If you want to be famous... If you work hard and if you'll get it. But then that what what comes of that fame? What what is fame? What is fame to you in your ideas? Fame is everybody knows me, everybody sees me, everybody sees what you're doing. But that means on a good day and a bad day. That means if you're walking down the street having a bit of a a, a rough day or someone's giving you crap or you're dressed shit, everybody that's fame. Everybody's gonna see, you. oh my god, look at him. So all of a sudden everybody's talking about you, everybody's talking the good and bad about you. So you're thinking, stop, get out of my business. Yeah. But you ask for that. So you've got to be careful what you wish for. You've got to be careful what you want. So if you want it enough, be careful how you ask for it and how you uh, understand what you actually want. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way I can actually explain it because I should never have become a world champion. I should never have, have achieved the things I did and get to the level of what I got to because I was probably, I've got a picture of myself, um, uh, Harold Graham, um, um, uh, Slug Row Tool uh, and Brendan. Black and white picture. I love the picture. And um, it's actually, it's up there. <laughs> and, and we're all stood in the picture. And you look at that picture, out of everybody there, the one who was least expected to succeed was me. Hmm. But in reality, the only one that succeeded to become world champion was me. But I was the least talented out of all three of us. And so, so the, the, what I had and what they didn't have was I had persistence, um, uh, hunger. I, I listened, I wanted to learn, and my ego was in check. So I was willing to listen. I was willing to, to go through the good as well as the bad to get to success. Mm -hmm. They had all the talent in the world. I didn't have nearly as much talent as those guys. But I always said, it, it's like having a cake. You can have all the ingredients. You're missing one piece, it just don't taste mm -hmm. right. I had the right ingredients to get to where they were. They didn't have the right ingredients to get to where I ended up. And so it was just, it was, it was what happens in the boxing world, it's an adaptable skill. So now what I do, I, I, I do a lot of talks in prisons uh, to try and, to tr I'm actually just reenacting what Brendan Lee does, took us to prisons. Uh, he talked to prisoners and we do a boxing exhibition. He'd say to the prisoners, he'd get the prisoners to talk about their lives and talk about how they ended up there and, and talk about the, the, the difference boxing made to him and everybody else. Uh, around the around Winkerbank, um, um, I, I I I do a lot of media stuff. Uh, I loved it. Talking about boxing is not a job. Talking about boxing is like the best gig in the world. Like, oh my god, someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and it's saying, mm -hmm. "Nanny, get off." You're talking about something you love. So so in a way, I'd say I'd not worked a day in my life. <laughs> um, um, and so and that's what it is. And and I, I live in I live in today. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Because we spend so much time worrying about tomorrow, we miss today. 
So yesterday, we, we, we were worried about today, we get today, and we're worrying about tomorrow. Instead of living in the moment, thinking, I'm here. Mm. I appreciate this. And, and, and that, again, it's an adaptable skill in every form. And so boxing teaches you so much about yourself because it's a very lonely sport. It's a frightening sport because when you're in the dressing room or when, you're, when you've trained really hard and you've sparred and you've got hit and you've got hurt, you, you then think, how much do I want this? Mm. I spent six, seven years on the road in Germany, in East Germany and in France as a sparring partner. I hated it. It was so lonely. And it made me decide whether or not I wanted it or not. And that lick, that slurping, by the way, is my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 it made me decide how much I actually wanted it. And, and, and there's a lot of soul searching in boxing. Yeah. It can be the loneliest place in the world. Well, it's so interesting you're talking about, you know, when you're talking about your early uh, gym colleagues, so to speak, you were the least likely to succeed, let alone least likely to become the world champion. Yeah. But there seems to be a consistency around the people that I speak with, and that's people who have gone on to have amazing success. And there's some sort of either chip on the shoulder or some sort of pain or something you know you're yeah. alluding to the soul search in there yeah. so i know that from a young age your your parents split up yeah. from a young age so you, and your dad wasn't present yeah how how much do you think that played a part in your what caused your hunger and what led to you having the success that you did have so it's not until i've gotten older I actually think about your path in life to say the first seven years of your life can be very impressionable yeah. upon you are uh, upon who you are and my dad my my memory and my earliest memory of my dad, who I didn't actually meet until I was thirty, was him pulling up in the street in a in a beige Cortina. Look, you know, a <laughs> beige Cortina, and uh, that's a car, by the way. And um, and he got out the car and he was trying to drag me into the car. He had my hand, and my mum came out of the house and grabbed my other hand. So they were pulling him in left, right, and centre, and she was arguing and shouting at him. And then anyway, she got a broom or something. She was hitting him and got me in the house. That was my memory of my dad until I met him again when I was 30 years old. And, um, and it was always that, I, I'd always craved for that security. Mm. I'd always craved for that, that, that um, to belong somewhere, to belong. I, I, want, I was a homeboy. Brendan always said, Johnny, you're a mummy's boy. I never wanted to leave home. I never wanted, I was happy to stay at home. You know, I was happy to just be mummy's boy. Um, out of all of us. I was the biggest crybaby out of all of our family. Um, and so for me to box, my brothers and sister, they still laugh now. You ended up a boxer. I was like, I was the biggest crybaby going. And um, and so for me to w fall in that sport, the only reason why I, I ended up boxing was to make friends at the boxing gym. But the downside of making friends at the boxing gym was you had to box. Mm-hmm. So I went, I went there to the gym with the lads and we trained and everything because the school I went to was a nice school on my side of town. They took, they took kids out of certain deprived areas of Sheffield. I was fortunate in one of them to go to this nice posh Catholic school run by nuns, posh side of town. So when I was at school, most of my friends were like, they'd go back to you know, work for their parents or whatever and you know, they'd go to college, university. I wasn't a clever kid at school. And so by the time I'd left school, they actually walked me out of school. I didn't stay for exams. I didn't do my school exams. I was rubbish. And, and um, <clears throat> so when I'd left school, I'm thinking, I've got no friends. Because my mum wouldn't let us play out on the street with the kids on, the, on our doorstep because, because she didn't want us to get in trouble. So we kind of sneaked out now and again. So I knew the kids from my area, but we weren't tight. We weren't friends. Um, so I knew, I understood that I need to make friends here because I ain't got no friends. And that's why I went to the boxing club because my brother went. And and my my one of my elder brothers, he was like my hero. He was mm. Mr. Cool. So I made my friends at the gym. I didn't want to box. I didn't want to fight. I didn't dream and think I want to be Muhammad Ali. I just went to, to to make friends at the gym. The downside was having to fight. And so and this is how I say some people fall on their path in life. You know, when I'd spar, I'd hold on for, for dear life. I'd run, I'd be like trying to get out of the way. And and they'd mock me and say, did say to my face, you're, you're shit, you. you, you're rubbish. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. Because <laughs> I was just with my mates having banter, we'd all train together and everything. And um, slowly but surely, my mates would drop off. They'd leave the gym, but I'd make another friend at the gym. So that was my life. That was my family. And fortunately, Brendan Ingle was a 
very clever guy where he could get the best out of you no matter what. And uh, and he saw in me that 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 he could do something with me. Not not as to be a world champion, but to do something. There was more to mm. me than what he could see. I was the kind of kid where an adult spoke to me. I'd like I'd be teary and want to cry. I didn't want to speak to adults. I didn't want that com- face-to-face confrontation. Mm. I couldn't sport, speak publicly. I, I just struggled. And Brendan spent time on me like he spent time on everybody in the gym. And his successes are not the fighters you see. There's something out where it shows the amount of fighters and success and champions we had in the gym. It's unbelievable. And um, and but his successes, his success stories are what happened outside the gym. Yeah. The amount of people he helped from the area, from the community, to, for uh, boys to become men, to become fathers, girls to become mothers, uh, become women to become mothers, to be successful in a career, to go to college, to go to university. Is massive. People have no idea. So when you see, you talk about Brendan Ingle and the success he's had with fighters, that's the tip of the iceberg. Mm. So he knew he could do something with me, be it boxing or whatever, or to further me to open my mind and broaden my horizons. But he knew it was a long job. And he said to me, you're, you're, a, mother, you're, you're a mother's boy and you're not going to grow up until you leave home. I'm like, I'm not a mother's boy. <laughs> Went home and told my mum. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and, and it, when I did do that, that's when I started to grow up. So it was the, it was that search for security. It's interesting, actually. I'll just start to make the, the links when you're saying yeah. I didn't like conflict, particularly with adults. Yeah. That the imprint potentially of that moment with your mum and dad, that kind of yeah. pulled back and forth was such a yeah. high conflict moment that it might have left a mark where you then just want to avoid situations like that. You don't want to feel the pain of that situation yeah. again. Yeah. But maybe, maybe Brendan Ingle, and just for context, as you mentioned him a few times, was your coach who you coach, credit yeah. a huge amount of your success yeah. and happiness and life to yeah. now. Maybe he filled a little bit of that absent father void, which allowed, which yeah. pulled you back. Into I actually the gym. used to wish when I, when so Brendan's house was across the road from the gym, and he, his sons uh, and daughters Dominic, John, Brendan Junior, uh, Bridget, Tara. When I used to see him walking home, I, no disrespect to my stepdad Benji, great guy. Uh, my mom, I used to think, I wish I was one of his kids. Mm. They go into his house. You know, Brendan always spoke to you, gave you, told you stories, spoke to you about history, religion, uh, boxing, philosophy. Or you just could walk. How many, do you think, and people watching this, how many people just go and walk and talk with somebody? They don't do it anymore. We're like this in our phone. Yeah. They don't do it. You're in the house, the bigger house, the less you see your family because everybody's in their, their different areas. Yeah. You know, we don't do it anymore. Brendan spent time with you to educate you. He taught you not to remember, but how to think. Schools teach you to remember. Yeah. Brendan taught you how to think. Use your brain, he'd say. Use your brain, come on. And he'd always be talking to you. And I, I used to envy his kids walking to his house. And, and to me, I just think, I know that, as I said, I met my dad when I was 30. When I met him, my ex, my ex wife, she at the t- my wife at the time, she she her family knew him. Mm. I didn't even know what he looked like, knew him, because he used to be bragging about his son being a boxer. And then they put it to him like, That's, we know his dad. And he lived in Black he lives in Blackburn. And um and so she invited him around to the house one summer. Your wife at the time. My wife invited you know to put us together. Did you want to do it? I didn't know. Mm. Uh, I was curious. And uh, I can remember knocked on the door. I opened the door and I looked at him and I, and I knew straight away who he was. Because, but, but he had blue eyes. I'm like, what the f- black guy with blue eyes, huh? Mm. So, so I'm like looking at him thinking, I said, you're my dad, aren't you? Anyway, how are you doing, son? Did you just know straight away? I, I knew straight away. Yeah. And I shook his hand. But when he called me son, I thought, Mm. Can't call me son. My my dad, my stepdad is my dad. Yeah. You know, I'm like, shook his hand and he said, Do you remember me? We kept went inside, we sat down. He said, Do you remember me? And I told him about that that time outside the house. Um and he said, How do you remember that? You're only three. And uh, I said, I just remember it. He said, You know what happened then? I said, I kind of put the pieces together. So here, mum, what happened was my dad, he um he he had a family elsewhere. My mum thought he used to work away, but he had a family. And my mum mom found out, she blew him out of the water, but my auntie, uh, she was still in touch with him. But my, and my mum knew this, so just to wind him up, she said, oh, I'm gonna give Johnny away for adoption. 
she wasn't. Um, um, just to tell him, just to wind him up, because my mum wanted to give him a mouthful. So he came to try and get me, to take me, to make, live with him. And so my mum saw me, I've got you, to pull me back in the house. And like, that's, that was that, that confrontation. Mm. But I remember that. And, um, and it just stood out to me no matter what. And so, and, and then when I was 16, 17, when my mum and my stepdad split up, and like my brothers had moved to London, so it was me, my mum and my sister, uh, left here in Sheffield, everybody moved to London. So that big family that were all crammed into a little house, all of a sudden everybody's growing up, disappearing. And I thought, I'm going to create my own family. I want my own family here. You know, my, my, no matter what. And, and I know what I want my kids to to see as kids. I know what I want to create as a as a father. Uh, I know what, what environment I want to create. Like this environment, family's family. And that's what I've said. We've had our, we have our family's family's family no matter what. Uh, and that's what I said to Debbie, you marry me, you know, we're, we're family for life. No matter where you are, what you're doing, we're family, um, as long as you understand that. So I created my own unit because to me, my strength, which I found out was if I might, if my, my foundations are stable, I can achieve anything. Mm. Once my foundations have become rocky, that's when I become rocky. It affects everything I'm doing. Uh, nothing's nothing's concrete. Nothing's nothing succeeds. So so I create a, a solid foundation. Your solid foundation is family, and uh, and and once you we all come from somebody. So once you create that solid foundation, that worked for me. You can achieve anything, but you need that solid foundation to think to yourself. No matter what, I've got my family. I can always come home. Um, and even now, like my mum, she lives in London. She's ninety four. February, wow. and the best sleep I get is when I go to my mum's house mm. and I get in that single bed <laughs> in her bedroom. The best sleep I get, the most it's the time I feel most at home. So, so I suppose if a psychology looked, a psychologist looked at it, you think, Jesus, I know where mm. this is. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just it was creating that 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 solid foundation. And I know that once I'd done that, that was the secret to my success uh, to to grow to get further. I think that's so great for people listening who might not have had a balanced childhood as well mm. because so many of us fear those things about ourselves or try and hide them or are ashamed of them. Mm. But I really think there's a pattern that's emerged where those are the things that make you. They're, they're the unique stories and the things. And actually, when you really start to dive into it and then talk about it, you realise it's actually not that unique. You're mm -hmm. not the only one. You're not the only person yeah. in the world who's going through that. Um, so I think it's really powerful that you, that you talk yeah, about that. Yeah, and, and that's why... Um, there's many lessons you learn and many lessons, but you've got to learn those lessons. And it's the saying I always say, you know, you've got to go through experiences, good and bad, mm. to get wisdom. So when good things happen to you, great. When bad things happen to you, you think, shit, why me? But to get wisdom, which means you know, now you know how the, how the end can be. Mm. Yeah, you know, Now you can fix it. You've got to go through those things. So now when good and bad things happen, the bad things aren't great, but you kind of learn from, you look and think, right, shit won't happen again. Mm -hmm. Right, I learn from that. You know, that's how I stopped being a loser as a fighter to being a winner. Mm. I thought, right, I'll fix it the next time. Ignore the the naysayers, Joe Nelson, you crap, this and even learn the next time and get better. So I embraced the good as well as the bad, um, and and that's what most people should do. My the, the 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 eureka moment for me was I understood the difference between nerves and fear, but I didn't understand it until I got to my late twenties. I used to look at other people like Prince Asim Hamid. Ryan Rolls, the youngsters coming through and doing amazing in the teens. And I'm thinking, I'm older than you. Why? What is going on? Because I was scared going into the ring. What I thought I was scared. And I'm thinking, what is the difference between me and them? How come they can do it? I've got the same training. We're doing the same thing. And it transpired that the fact that what it was, was I was nervous. So when I was nervous and you're sweating and you're panicking, your heart's mm -hmm. going and everything, you know, I thought that was fear. So I mistook nerves for fear. So for fear, all of a sudden I'm thinking, I don't want to be, a, it's like fight or flight. So I, d I, didn't, I didn't encompass, I didn't support those nerves until it kept happening and kept happening, kept happening. And then eventually, I think I was in a dressing room once. I, I can't remember where I was. Uh, no, no, I was out in Germany actually, sparring with, uh, um, with, France, sparring with Fabrice Teoso, world, ch world champion. And, uh, and I was beating him up in sparring. And I thought, 
why am I beating this guy up? He's world champion and I'm not. What mm. is the difference between me and him? And you've got to have this conversation with yourself. You've got to check it out yourself. And it was that he could perform, perform in public. So then you break it down. Why can he perform in public and you can't? Again, because I get scared. Oh, what are you scared of happening? What's the worst thing that can happen? You can get hit, yeah. You can get killed, yeah. Well, don't do it. Do something else. So I'm having this argument, this conversation, this breakdown with myself until it got to a point where I thought, they must think the same thing. But then, then I remembered something. As my first sparring job, Alex Blanchard told me. And he said, he said, nerves are good. And I thought, I'm not scared because I keep coming back. Every fight I get in the ring and I've got this feeling and I think I'm scared. I thought, I ain't scared. I'm nervous. So nerves are good because nerves puts you on point. Nerves are like, you're like a deer in the woods. You're, you're on alert. That's what the, the mm. beat of the heart is, the pump of the blood is. That's nerves. So then I understood, I thought, you're not scared, you dickhead. You're nervous. So I thought, all right, now I've got it. So once you run with fear, run with it, not from it. Once you control it and understand what it is, those nerves will make you perform to the best of your ability. The speed you create, the moves, the, the cameos are brilliant because you're using that fear, those ner that nerves, to, to be spontaneous, to be sharp and be smart. But, but you've got to understand what it is. And, and, and once I said that, I said it so in public, you know the amount of messages I got from fight fighters or people saying, oh my God, that's me. Mm. I've got it, you're right, you're spot on right. And so we, we mistake nerves for fear. Once you understand what nerves is and nerves are good, then you will run with fear. You'll run with it because you think, come on, bring it on. You want to be nervous. You want that. It's when you start being nervous, you want to worry because then you become complacent and then you're going to end up getting beaten by somebody mm -hmm. that shouldn't beat you because you're not on point. You're not thinking like an instinctively. You're not using your everything you've got. And so, and these are lessons you have to learn through years of experiences of, of going through things left, right, and centre. And that's to me is why I say boxing is a, a transferable skill. Mm. Yeah, it's it's huge. The that comparison or the or the the definition of nerves versus fear is mm. is massive. Like whether you're delivering a talk in at work and standing up in front of people or stepping mm. into the ring to fight for the world championship. And yeah, if you can do it, you can do it. Yeah. And so you, you've got to understand, I can actually do this. Mm. So. But, get it, have a word with but yourself. But you've got to do it to get over it. Yeah. Push yeah, yourself exactly, into yeah. Exactly. I look at my first world title attempt. I was 22. Box here in Sheffield. I drew for the WBC title. On paper, it's a great feat for a guy of my experience up to that point. To do, with little experience to do that. And I look at that fighter on TV and I want to put my hand in the screen and slap him in the face because I know he's, he, 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 he's misunderstanding mm. that feeling, that gut feeling. I think, come on, Johnny, wake up. And my life could have been so different. Mm -hmm. But then you think everything happens for a reason. So I had to go through all those experiences in life to get to the point where I understood what was going on. That, that is huge, I think. And I've had a lot of that recently because I'm, I'm just turned 34 and it's during this period where you start to realise a lot about yourself yeah. and a lot about the old version of yourself. Mm. It's difficult to have compassion with what you then might perceive as the weaker version of you or mm. the person who didn't quite get it in that moment. And you kind of... Sometimes I get sad because I'm like, fuck's sake, I, I yeah. could have done something differently or, you know, so it's, it's hard to try and have compassion for yourself. It is, it? and that's what I'm saying. And that's why at the time when people were telling me stuff at the time, I didn't get it because I was all so consumed mm. by what I thought was the reality. And, and some people instinctively know who they are. They get that side of themselves. Yeah. I didn't. I was a late developer in everything. So, so, so then once the penny had dropped... Once I know something, it doesn't matter. A million people could tell me I'm wrong. I will stick to my guns. I'll be, because the amount of people told me to jack in, I was rubbish, I was no good. And then I became world champion, setting a record of defences that haven't been, hasn't been broken to this day. The all them people are like, oh, well done, you're brilliant, you're done. I'm thinking, you are people mm. telling me I was shit. But I don't <laughs> even actually remind them of that because that, them doing that made me stronger, yeah. thinking, you've taught me such a lesson. So if I know, I can see a path to where I want to achieve and where I want to go and how it can be done. It doesn't matter how many people tell me you can't do this. I can do anything. I, I know I can. And so, and if you believe that, it doesn't matter if it's true or not because you believe it. Mm, amazing, Johnny. Because what you're doing, rather than having those negative feelings and that low frequency vibration, mm. you're coming with gratitude. Like, thank you. You yeah. made me 
who I was by saying I was shit or by not believing yeah. in me or whatever. That's right. You could, you could easily say, I told you so. Yeah. You, um, but you don't because I just What's think... The What's the point? Yeah, what is the point? Yeah. You know, I've learned such a lesson. And, and that is, again, transferable skill. It's life. Mm. So, so from the, that wall to that wall, you know, that's life. And you want to get to that wall to success. And on your way here, you're going to get distracted by family, friends, job, death, success, wealth. Put, but and all these things are, are set to take you off course to get to there and i'm not saying ignore all these things deal with them but don't take your eye off mm. your focus so you deal with them yep deal with it boom deal with them but and, and what happens in life most of us we're going through life and then we 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 get taken off yeah. that path and then you forget about your, your that, that desire might you might get married you might have kids then you think no nah, no nah, i can't do that now because mm. i've got this mm. so we can all do it but it's, it all depends on how much you want it how much you want that success. Yeah. Great analogy. I love that. You can tell a lot about a man by his bookshelf. Right? When I was, <laughs> when I was setting up, <laughs> when I was setting up, I was having a little look. So two copies of the Daily Stoic. Yeah. You got um, the monk who sold his Ferrari, Robin yeah. Sharma, one of the greats. Um, well, I have to remind myself. You got, uh, oh, the Think Like a Monk, Jay Shetty. That's another yeah. good one. Yeah. You got the Tyson Fury book as well uh -huh. i'm drawing a lot of comparisons i read that a while ago with his trainer gus D'Amato, who transformed to the way that he he thought wrongly or rightly you, know, you mike tyson mike yes tyson, yeah what mike did tyson, i say yeah. but you said tyson fury tyson fury <laughs> sorry yeah. mike, mike tyson um because the book's called tyson yeah. Yeah, yeah um and his influence on him right everything from auto suggestion and like the old techniques that he used in order to make him the youngest yeah. heavyweight world title champion ever mm. You had a similar story and a similar influence from from Brendan. What's if you distilled it? What would be the biggest lesson that he gave you? Because you've you've mentioned a few already, but what's the what's the main thing that he left you with? Believe in yourself. He taught us to think, and as he was teaching us to think, we 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 didn't appreciate the moment. He was teaching us to think. Once you believed in yourself, in yourself, it does not matter what anybody else says. And he keep and, and even when I'd retired, he said, Johnny, look where you started. You had 13 amateur fights. You won three. People didn't tell you you were rubbish to your face uh, behind your back. They told you to your face. You went on to turn professional. You lost your first three on the trot. People were saying, Why are you wasting your time? You're rubbish, you are garbage. Look at where you've ended up. You saw a world title, the world record of defense as a, as a world champion. What nobody thought you could ever achieve. You didn't just win the world title, you kept it to defend it so many times, that is the strongest thing ever. But because we are so easily, many are so easily swayed by the negatives coming from left, coming left, right, and center, what happens is we, 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 we're, we're, we're letting those people impression, you know, mm. make an impression on you. So, so the example would be, the example would be I, I think to myself, if, you, if you're a fighter or if you're a sportsman, uh, man or woman, and you're on social media, and a lot of them say, I've come off social media because it does my head in. Yeah. The biggest idiot is you, is me, the sportsman. Because if I'm the one getting up at stupid o'clock in the morning to train, to diet, to kill myself, to be shattered, and, and, and then I'm going to read something from some armchair champion, oh, he's not very good. And I'm going to believe him when I'm the one that's putting the work in, more fool me. Mm. So, so just because you're getting negativity spread upon you and people saying you can't do it, doesn't mean you can't do it. How about this one? Maybe just they just don't know as much as you do. You know, so it's about being mentally strong. So all those books are about that. Yeah. We spend so much time in the gym getting big muscles, getting looking spark, doing a certain time on the track. But how many people train that? Mm. So training that, you don't have to be a, 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 a wordsmith. You don't have to be, you, what you need to do is you need to, to train your mind, to learn how to discipline your mind, to learn how to, to, to work. So when I, when, I was, when I'd run, I didn't run with earphones in like most people do. You'd have earphones in so you could, the run becomes easier mm -hmm. because you don't want to think about being tired. So how are you training your mind? Take the earphones out have your head, have your mind listen to your body, the ache in the knee, the pump of the breath. You're like, oh my God, I'm knackered. You need to have that argument with yourself 
to educate your mind to deal with the boredom, to deal with that, that, that doubt. So you're training your mind, you're making your mind strong. And so therefore, when it comes to performing, and there's times where your mind would drift off, you have disciplined your mind and trained your mind to think, I'm on this, mm. you ain't getting me. And it happens so much, in, especially in my sport, between round six and round nine, and when fighters that are winning lose, because your mind switch off because you can get a little bit bored. Mm -hmm. you, you'll drift a little bit. You, you've got to stay focused. And so to me, this, training this is more as, as important as training this. So so I can take anybody to the gym and say, do that, do this, do that. We've got to discipline our, our own mind. We've got to do it for ourselves. So you've got to find little tricks that work for yourself. I fast once a week on a Monday. Mm. All day. No, uh, all, from, from Sunday night mm. until Tuesday morning. Mm. Every uh, week? Uh, every week. So I don't eat anything. I'll drink, but I don't eat anything. Just what? water or Water. I'll have, a, I'll have, I may have a, a, like a, a vitamin to drink. I put a little yeah. uh, a multivitamin in it. Not because, for religious reasons, not any, but I do it to just give myself that stability, that discipline, that one thing I've got to do for me. And, and doing that, and at times, and I find it harder, uh, say a Sunday night, it's all right, because I've eaten Sunday daytime, I can go to bed, I get up some Monday morning, get to about 10 o'clock, if I've not occupied myself, you start thinking, shit, I want something to eat. Mm. If I get to three o'clock, I've not done bad, you know, then, and then I think, right, just three, get through the night, and then you're done, you've done it. You know, and it's hard, but you, you, you're disciplining your mind, mm. because now you're physically feeling it, and mentally, you're, you're having an argument with yourself, stuff it, I'll just have that, I'll just have this. And to me, it's my, that's my little thing that I do every Monday. I, I stopped eating pork when I was 13 years old. I love bacon. I still love the smell of it. I look at it and think, oh my God, I bet that is. <laughs> but I wanted to give myself one thing that, that as a young man that I knew I could, I, I had discipline that I could control. And once I'd done that, I knew if I decided on anything, I thought I'm not going to do it. I knew I could do it. I know I could, if I was smoking, I could stop smoking because I knew I could do it. I knew I had the discipline for it. If you don't discipline yourself in some little thing, then, then you'll never know. You'll, never, you'll find it very hard to discipline yourself in anything. So, and even when you don't have to do it, if you understand what I'm saying. So basically, say if you're, I don't know, you're a, you're a drinker or, or, or a smoker or you like bacon or you like, you love a, a cream pie or whatever, try and, try and, Take it out of your life one day a week. One day a week. Or try and stop smoking one day a week. And if you do it just one day a week, then the other six days when you're smoking, you'll think it'll make you stronger for that one day. Mm -hmm. And then you think, you know what? I'm going to try it on a Monday. I'm going to try it on a Friday. So that's two days of stop smoking. So you've got five days where you're smoking and you think, but what you've done is you're, you're, you're teaching yourself to mentally be strong mm -hmm. and disciplined to try and, to, 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 so you can achieve anything. It's a transferable skill. And that's why, because, because if, you, if you go on a diet, you think, I can't, I can't do this diet. You know you can do it because you are, you're teaching your mind to say, no, no, I ain't doing mm -hmm. that. You know, yeah. you've got to trick your mind, do things that work for it. Yeah, that's superb. I love that, Johnny. I have cold showers every morning for a similar, similar reason. I have that internal negotiation or battle with myself mm -hmm. and every morning it's like, nope. Yeah. I'm turning it all the way to cold and yeah. it, that, you know, I think I'd love to give that a go. I'd love to it's have the It's a little the, the something, that's what I'm saying. It's a little something. So the digestive system, it takes 15 hours to clear up the digestive mm -hmm. system completely. So the average American has got about a stone of food in it at one time. So 15 hours, just 15 hours. So, so to me, I thought, right, Sunday, have a nice Sunday dinner from uh, uh, Sunday night, uh, eight o'clock, I ain't having nothing else to eat. I sleep Sunday night, get up Monday morning. Monday morning, right, that's, this is the hard bit. You go through the day. That's when that battle starts. You think, God, I'm hungry. Drink, do whatever. I still train on that day. Mm -hmm. I still drink, re replay. I'll, no, I won't change any of my, anything I'm doing. Uh, and then that night time, I'll go to bed and I'll be thinking, right, tomorrow, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that, I'm gonna have this. <laughs> so whatever time I stopped on the Sunday is the time I start on the Tuesday. So if I stopped at six o'clock on the Sunday, I can eat from six o'clock Tuesday morning. If I stopped at eight o'clock, I can eat from eight o'clock Tuesday morning. And you know the feeling, you think, yes, 
I don't need anybody else to tap me on the show and I'm tapping myself, mm-hmm. well done. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a little battle, a little, a little exercise that you can give yourself. Yeah. And this is why I'm talking about smokers and drinkers. Take it out of your life for one day. Yeah. Just one day. So you've not stopped smoking. So maybe it's maybe it's easy to do things, mm. you know what, today I'm not smoking, just today I'm not smoking. And then when you get used to that day of 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 not doing it, then you think, well, I'm gonna try two days. Mm-hmm. Then do it that way. I, I I I the way, how I got that was when it, I ate a diet to make the weight, I'd uh, I'd give myself a pig day, one pig day a week. So I love Mr. Kipling's cherry bakewells. Same. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so and I love Walker's crisp. I could kill a 24 pack easy. So, so when I had my fights and I had to diet, I'd, to stick to the diet, I'd buy it. I'd, every time I'd see it in the shop or whatever, I'd buy it and put it in a cupboard and a thing like, Saturday, you're mine. <laughs> Saturday, and I'd buy it and I'd put, the, put them in the cake. I'm looking forward to Saturday. And then Saturday came. I could never finish it all, but I, I could eat it. I knew I could do it, but it helped me stick to and be disciplined with mm. my diet all week. Until Saturday. So you're not wasting that diet. What you're doing is you're disciplining your mind to be strong. And so, and, and, and then all of a sudden you think, you know, I don't need it. But you're tricking your mind to think, we'll have that Saturday. Mm. You're never going to finish all the Mr. Kipling's and all the crisps you put in that cupboard. You probably eat a few of them and think, oh God, I've got a food coma. But you've disciplined yourself to stick to the chunk of it. Yeah. Then eventually, it's just about training that. Yeah. And that's why all these books are about making your mind strong. Yeah. Well, the secret to building confidence is keeping se- uh, keeping promises to yourself. Yeah. So as soon as you set yourself that target and you stick to it, that's yeah. when you start to build self-confidence, self-worth. And, and, and if you break that promise, then you know it's kind of self-loving thing. You yeah. Can't do this, and it affects everything. Yeah, see, I knew I was a fucking, yeah. you know, whatever. And, you know, when we're tired <laughs> and bad things happen, which inevitably do, it's very easy to fall back into that, oh, I'll have a bake well just to make myself feel better. Yeah, and that's it. So it's, yeah. just, it's just creating little things for yourself. Mm. We are our biggest hero. We are our biggest enemy. Yeah. And yeah. and it doesn't matter what anybody says. The norm is what you create, is what you make mm. it. Sp- speaking to you now, though, is so inspiring. And I'm in my element is listening to you, to you go through it. But you spoke about earlier how, you know, you were, the, you were the first person to cry or get upset and get controlled by his emotions. Mm. So what was the journey for you to get into that kind of, you know, strong-willed, strong-minded individual that you are today? Like, when did that start to shift? Uh, now I put things into compartment. I still cry. Um, uh, but now I don't think... I can remember when Brendan passed away, I couldn't talk about him without blubbering. Mm. And so and I, I'm like so angry at myself because I was angry at myself because it wasn't that I was ashamed of crying. It was, ash- it was, it was I was frustrated because I couldn't get out what I was trying to say about how much of a good man he was. So as time had gone by, I'm thinking, mm. have a word with yourself, Johnny. Come on. You know, I don't feel as ashamed of crying. I probably did at first, but I thought, you know, we all cry. Yeah. And no matter if anybody sees it or not. Uh, and there's, for, a, there's, there's a difference between crying because you're feeling an emotion, you're allowing yourself yeah. to feel it versus getting overwhelmed and controlled by the emotion. Like, you know, when you yeah. said like your bottom lip would go yeah. and it's just like, oh, yeah. and you, your emotions what, grip but, but what, you. But what happens to people, because when they're talking about it, they, they, they put themselves back in that moment, mm. that moment of emotion. Yeah. So that's why they get like, I do it. And so, and so what I do now is I put things into compartment and these things are something you've got to do every day. Now to, now what started that was when I, as I said, when I first boxed for my world title and now how I was as a mm-hmm. bit of a kid, teary kid, when I boxed for the world title in Sheffield and I, it was a proper rude awakening. I was a mummy's boy, 22 years old. I thought everybody was my mate, you know, everybody's ringing my phone and Johnny, it's that never. Then when I, I drew and it was a terrible fight, I saw she, how bad human nature could be. People were slagging me down, calling me a tosser to my face. You know, they were, they were proper disrespectful to me everywhere. And I'm like, I just can't get it. I just think, how can people be so wicked? You know, then I appreciated when you see a newspaper, not many people reading that, and you see a little cartoon about somebody in a newspaper, <clears throat> um, it's all right to laugh at, but then eventually, whoever that person, it, that's about somebody. Yeah. So what about that person you're laughing at? And, 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 and so... That's, that's someone's mother, someone's father, someone's brother, someone's son. That's dead, still a person. So, so then eventually, when I saw that side of it, there's nothing you can do about it. Because if you hit one person and giving you shit, you've got to hit everybody. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you're a bully. Yeah. So you've got to clock it. You think, you've got to hold it down, bite your lip and think, how do I deal with this? Do I ha- run away and hide? 
oh, wipe my, wipe my lip and think, oh, all right, no problem. Yeah. I got The only person that can fix it is you. So you can cry and blubber there and then. The issue's still there when you finish crying and blubbering. So, so if this is still there, what are you going to do about it? As far as I was concerned was, I will fix this and I'm not going to take it personal, especially from someone I don't know personally. Mm -hmm. Everybody has an opinion. You could say this is grey, I could say it's black. You know, it's just a difference of opinion. That's how you look at life differently. Yeah. It's understanding human nature, never be surprised by mm -hmm. it. And so, so to me, that was a, my lesson that started to learn of discipline and putting things into a compartment. Yeah. And now and again, it spills over. I think that, that when it spilled over the most was when Brendan died. And I thought, oh, shit, you've started again. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and that probably started a, a waterfall of, of things. And I don't mind saying that. It doesn't make me any less of a man. Mm. I just think I had to understand what was going on. Yeah. And, and and that's why when, I've trained, when I'm thinking about disciplining myself in understanding the difference between nerves and fear, when I've disciplined myself in many things, it's putting all those things into practice and controlling that emotion when it can be controlled. But now and again, you've got to let it go. Yeah. You've got it's, to be smart enough. It's funny how <clears throat> much we defend our own opinions though, yeah. isn't it? Like, so, you know, you're saying that everyone's allowed their own opinion. Of course they are. But because we're constantly searching for who we are or what our identity yeah. is, we believe that we are our opinions. We are what we believe yeah. at the time. But those things change over time for us anyway. I thought I was the best fighter in the world when I was world champion. I believed I was the best fighter in the world. Doesn't mean I was. Mm. Uh, my truth was, as far as I was concerned, I was the best fight in the world. That's what I live by. I'm quite sure there was somebody at my weight, somewhere in the world, that could have beat me. I just never met him. Yeah. But in my, as far as I was concerned, I was the best professional fighter in the world when I was world champion. And no one was ever going to beat me. I say it now with conviction. That's what I really believed in. It doesn't matter if I'm wrong or right, but hmm. that's what I believe in. So wait, you could argue with me, say, now nah, you'd be, I don't give a shit, no one. <laughs> I believe it. So it's, it's what your truth is, it's what you live by, it's what you look at. So when people have said to me, would you have beaten such and such, such and such, I'll tell you yes or no. You know, and because that's what I believe. That's my opinion. So why would I, I go with your opinion when you don't know me, you don't yeah. know what makes me, you don't want yeah. to know what makes me tick. You know, so, and this is, this again, a transferable skill. It's in anything. If you think, and you can see how, what you can achieve, what you can do, it doesn't matter what anybody says. If you really believe it and you really think you can do it, that's enough. Mm. And that's, that, that, it's lonely because not everybody will believe in you. I'm the only person that believed I was world champion, was, was the best in the world just before I became world champion was Brendan. Mm. And I said to Brendan, when I, when I was boxing for the world title uh, against Carl Thompson, I said, Brendan, I don't understand it. I can't see how this guy's going to beat me. We were driving in the car up at Newman Road. And he said, and he said, oh, am I missing something? He said, Johnny, it's not what they think. It's what you think. As long as you know, it doesn't matter what they think. Just do you. Yeah. I'm like, you're all right. <laughs> so even guys and mates that I knew and people, and I knew read a newspaper, Nelson's, Nelson's going to get turned over. I didn't take it personal. I thought, you just don't know me. Yeah. And but and again, it's something that is adaptable to every part of, of our social life, our life, our relationships and everything. Mm. Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to tell him what you thought of him? Brendan? Yeah. Oh, God, he knew. Oh, he knew. I would never have been the person I am today uh, if it wasn't for Brendan. I would never have achieved the things I achieved if it wasn't for Brendan. You know, I hold him on a pedestal. And mm. when you come across a good man, you re he was a good man. And I know many people. Brennan was a good man. And, and he did a lot of selfless acts. And you wouldn't know about it. I do. He did things for me that, that, that he, he, I couldn't tell people. I'll tell you now. He's passed away. So I'm, I'm, but, but I can remember I, I was before I boxed for the world title... Uh, I didn't have a fight for I think it was 13 or 18 months and I was struggling financially I didn't work I just boxed and Brendan said come to the house went to his house mm. he gave me £250 a week every week for 13 months he said I'm going to keep and this, I want you to tell you are I'm going to give you this if you tell anybody I'm giving you this it stops and I want the money back I'm like <laughs> with the catch I went alright so every Friday go there 250 quid and I'm thinking 
this guy didn't have to do this. You know, he's helping me out. He's helping my family out. He didn't have to do this. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out where's the angle. Why are you doing this? And the, the deal was, so he didn't do it for a tap on the back because I wasn't allowed to tell anybody. So I thought, why are you doing this? He knew I was struggling. He knew, he knew what my, my end goal was. He knew what, what I, I had the discipline to do what I had to do. He didn't have to do it. Just that, that among many things, but that's the one that to me, I think you're a good man because there's no angle for you at all. Boom, every month, every week. And, and he said, but if you tell anybody it stops and I want it back. That was it. And I thought, you know what? It's not very often you come across somebody that do selfless acts. Mm. And I was walking through, and you learn, you know, you learn when you walk and talk. I was walking through King's Cross the other day. And when I pass a beggar or somebody that's not got, I, I try, and it's hard because people say, don't give them money because they might, yeah. be, for, might be for drugs. Mm. Not everybody's on drugs. <clears throat> um, but I'll give, if I've got a coffee, I'll give them the coffee. Yeah. If I've got some to eat, I'll give them some to eat. If I'm if I've got it there, uh, and I, I I was I got to King's Cross, and this this young guy came up to me, and uh, he put his hand out and he said, uh, "I need someone to sleep." He's freezing. I need someone to sleep. Have you got some money? He said, "I and I obviously he'd obviously got a few knockbacks." So his 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 his, his uh, presentation of that. His delivery of that question, that question came a bit aggressive. Mm. And uh, have you got some money? I need somewhere to sleep tonight. And it's to the right state. And there was a security guy outside this um, bar stroke hotel. And he knew me from the boxing. And uh, when the guy came up to me, the security guy stepped forward and went, whoa, whoa, get back. I went, no, 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 leave him. He's all right, leave him. I said, what's your name? Tommy's name. I said, come on. So he walked across the road to King to, uh, to Burger King. And as he walked in Burger King, he got a security guard in Burger King. As he walked in Burger King, um, the security guard stood up to stop him, went, leave him, he's with me, leave him alone. So I went to the bar, said, well, what do you want? He said, I need some money to sleep. I said, you need some food in your belly. That's what you need. Because I thought, I didn't know that, I thought if, if you want the hotel, that's 50, 60 quid. I didn't understand you could go to some mm. some uh, um, some lodge or something and, and pay seven pounds. I didn't know that. So I thought, the money I'm giving you ain't going to pay for some hotel room. So I said, come. So I said, what do you want? He went, I, I want some money for you. I'm right. Biggest burger, biggest drink, boom, boom. And the pay for my train was coming. And I, and it was warm inside Burger King. And, um, and so I said it loud. I said, right, I paid for your food because there were three people behind there and the security guys, guys, guys there want to kick him out. This is why I said it loud so I didn't, didn't throw him out. I paid for your food. That's your food. These people can t not tell you to come out. You sit down here in the warmth and eat it. I said, that's his to the woman that served me. Point to the security. That's his. Leave him alone. That's his. You know, just to give, put some food in his mm. belly. To, to me, that, to me, doing that, I'd expect someone to do that for me if I was in his position. So I can I, how can I expect to do that when, when I'm not going to do it for somebody else? But what, what an advert for Brendan in the first place, passing it on to you, because yeah. it's, it's the pay it forward model, isn't it? Yeah, it's like I, so I did it with my daughter. We were yeah. driving through London. We pulled up at the traffic lights, and we know those guys that cleaned the window. Um, and this guy looked in the right state, and... Uh, I made, a, made my daughter, my daughter was driving through. The guy come to clean it. She went, get away. I went, Bailey, stop. Stop, leave him. And I said, yo, yo, come around here. And he wants to clean the car. I said, leave him. So I had a load of change in the middle. I, I took it out. And Bailey said, no, dad, no. I said, Bailey, stop. And gave him the change. I said, go and do somebody else. You don't have to clean my window. So dad, Bailey's like, dad, why have you done that? Yeah. I said, Bailey, you see that man there? He's someone's son. Might be someone's father, brother or sister. That could be me. I said, so, so if that was me and, and you were in your car and you saw me, would you want someone to do that for me? And she went, well, well, yeah. I said, so what you'd expect for yourself or for your own, you've got to do for others. Yeah, but daddy might have spent it on drugs. I said, he might not have spent it on drugs. I said, but to do that would have been hard enough for him alone to, to come begging for money. Mm. I said, so you've got to think about things differently. 
I was reading the book the other day. Do you know the basketball player, Carmelo Anthony? Yes, yeah, he was yeah. talking yeah. about how the, yeah. that squeegeeing and cleaning the windscreen was such a huge part of his childhood because he went and did it. He'd get his few dollars here and there and it allowed him to go and buy trainers, yeah. which meant him, made him feel like a completely different person and contributed hugely to... Mm. Obviously, he had skills and talent and hard work and everything else, but just that little thing as a kid who's got nothing. Yeah. You know, so it's really important to but support... But he's passing it on. Yeah. So I'm glad I did that while my daughter did because hopefully she'll do it and she'll do it for her kids. Mm. You know, if and... and, and it, it's that might that's if you can do it and everybody's doing that kind of thing then it lifts people yeah. you know it's very easy to 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 be blind and not see things or to ignore people but people are in that position for yeah. a reason you know not everybody's on drugs not everybody's bad you know but some people hit a hard time yeah and so i believe brendan passed that on to me how i how i think about people how i think about myself how i think about society we don't have to conform to what is supposed to be the norm. You know, you do what is right. Mm. You do what you think is right. It doesn't matter if you think everybody else thinks it's wrong or right. You do what you think is right. Then the world will be a better place. The best time I was in London was when the Olympics were on in 2012. Yeah. Everybody was shaking, saying, hello, yeah. all right. I'm like, shit, in London. <laughs> and it was nice. It was proper nice. I thought, it's nice, this. I thought, what's happened? Yeah. You know, 2012, it's the best time. I can remember when I'm in London, everybody that I spoke to, They'd like say hello when you're near Olympic Park. They're all they're really nice. Why aren't people like that most of the time? Mm. You don't have to be nasty. Yeah, I think it's like foundation again, isn't it? You, mm. you come up against difficult times, whether it's COVID or whatever else, and you people tend to go into a little bit more of a selfish mode, a bit yeah. more victim. We were talking about you and your kind of development with your ability to manage your emotions and that sort of thing. What have you seen and observed in for other fighters and athletes when you've been on either like ringside or gloves are off like that kind of thing because you see them in their moment of mm. potential success you know like they're, they're like key moments in their life and you see how they manage that because obviously now you've got the ability to hold that energy and you're yeah. the, you're the calm person in that situation and i love the role you play in there you're so good at doing it what have you observed in people in those moments well you're willing to make a deal with the devil at that stage mm. and i know that because i kind of did as well you know you you're, you're willing to die in the ring so when guys are saying i'll die in there you'll before you beat me i'll die you believe it at the time until you get a bit older and you might be thinking jesus what was i thinking yeah you know and so so when you when you when i see guys saying and doing things and acting certain ways i think the emotions are raw because if you're fighting somebody I'm fighting you for, and I'm, I'm going to think about you 24-7 until our fight comes on I'm going to think about you more than my wife and kids because I'm consumed by you I'm mm. training for you I'm eating for you and so 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 that's the only time you can boxing's the only place you can legally get killed and so 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 you've got to think to yourself there are a lot of things you're saying and committing yourself to you know it's raw because you don't know any better until you get old you think Jesus what was I thinking yeah how many fighters have you seen that were amazing entertainment when they stood there and having toe-to-toe -to -toe blast and battles? And then when they finish boxing and they're punch drunk and they can't tie their shoelaces and nobody cares about them, who cares? Mm -hmm. Who goes to visit them? Who watches them? Who looks out for them? Who cheers for them? Who claps for them? Who pays money to go and see them? So, so when you're committing yourself to such a sport, um, if you can detach it's a it's a job. It's a bit. And there's only a few people that can that can that can detach it. This is the job. It's my business. If you think you are boxing is who you are, you're going to struggle when you finish boxing because you're going to want people to talk to you and act around you the same way they did when you were yeah. world champion. Yeah. In in the real world, that don't work. Yeah. And so, whatever you do now as a fighter coming up or when you become champion. Remember, it's going to kick you in the ass mm -hmm. when you're no longer a champion, when you're no longer a fighter. And you and sometimes you're going to say and do things, you think, shit, why did I say that? Why did I yeah. do that? Yeah, so interesting. What, what was your favourite one of those? What's, what's been one of the ones when you've just been like, wow, this is... Gloves are off? Yeah. Well, uh, there's three. Okay. Uh, so it's a struggle. So the first one was Carl Frost and George Groves. Yeah. You, so that was the first time I realised... This is a proper gig, this. Because Carl Froch is, he's my favourite to work with. Okay. He's funny, he's dry. Um, mm -hmm. He can be a bit of a knob sometimes, but he knows it. <laughs> so sometimes he'll, uh, um, he'll mention the 80,000 and yeah. then when the camera goes off him, he'll go, ah. and you're laughing, but he knows it pisses people off. 
And so he'll sneer, he'll be like, and I know he's a, he's a funny guy. He's a, pro a proper like him. Uh, but when we did the gloves are off with him and George Groves, and George Groves pulled him over the table, Carl wears his heart on his sleeve and he pulled him back. He said, hey, we can all have a push in the pulse. And I'm like, shit, yeah. <laughs> really? This guy's like, look, you shit the cameras. I'm like, shit. And that was the first one I thought, bollocks, these two hate each yeah. other. George, is, George has become a friend of mine. I, I love him to bits. Yeah. I think he's brilliant. He's we talked a lot because I met him through the podcast and yeah. we stayed close. He spoke at my event recently and I was messaging him yeah. about speaking to you as well, actually. So he was giving him, me some questions. Um, but I love him. I think he's great. Like his mind games and the way he, he really knew what he was doing. He's the best. George, at the time I thought, he's a bit of a knob. <laughs> he is the best <laughs> yeah. at getting under people's skin. He's so calm, isn't and he? And he's really? calm about how he drops yeah. it and everything. I'm like, and once I dropped, I thought, my man <laughs> he's cool man yeah. you know and because I've seen I've seen him get under the skin of so many fighters and I thought good on you George in fact you asked you said that didn't you to Frotch yeah. you said he's got under your skin hasn't he yeah. and he admitted it he was like yeah, yeah he has got under my skin yeah. and that, that's what I'm saying and George and George just have done it and so that was the first one I thought this is for real mm. then you can do one or two where people are trying to make out as a, as a, and you can see straight through it Yeah. the second one after that was Dylan White and Anthony Joshua. Mm. Now, a lot of it got cut out. Did it? Um, and, and Dylan White and Anthony Joshua, to this day, they don't really like each other. To this day, you know, there's that out of the out of boxing, that street thing that's going on, as it's today, there's that. Yeah. And when you see them both in an in air, watch them. You know, they don't, they're like lions circling at one end and they're like, <laughs> uh, there's no love lost there. And Dylan was saying some things and I'm like, and, and, and AJ's trying to be cool, saying, yo, listen, we don't want to be talking that here now. Get the camera off. Because he's talking out of school, talking things about you. And like, Dylan's not caring. You I did this, you did that. And like, yeah. Carl, Carl, you know, you, AJ's like, yo, yo. And so there was what, no love. What, what are you doing in that moment? I'm are you, sat are you there, letting it go? I, I'm letting it go. Yeah. I'm letting it go because I'm thinking, this is what it is. This is raw emotion. It's what it is. To edit it and cut out things that you can't say on there. But I'm like watching thinking, this is for real. Yeah. It's for real. So you know you're going to have a good fight when these two fight because... And it was. Yeah, and it was. Was that... Am I right in thinking that's the when they threw the water on each other? No, no. That's Dylan White and uh, Don't Shizora. Oh, of course. Yes. And that's the and third that was the table one. flipping That's the really. third one. Okay, all right. Right. So that was the third one. And when that kicked off and you had to cut it after 20 minutes, trust me, that was mad where the point where... Dylan, Dylan went launched for Derek. They went the waters all over the floor, so they slipped on the floor. They bit Dylan in the chest. If you were a man, scream like ah, screaming. And Dylan go mad. Jumpers come off, and his boys are trying to get inside the inside inside the room. Derek's boys are outside, so you're thinking the shit outside, the shit inside. The security man shut the door of his all in the studio, so the cameramen uh, are trying to part everybody up. You know, but he's trying to drag everybody apart from each other. Big fella, Scott, uh, um, Scott Drummond. He's a big cameraman, nice guy, pro ex rugby player. He's trying to pull him apart with his camera on his shoulder, <laughs> and I'm like, I've got all the somebody's like, boy, stop, stop! <laughs> Fight like hell. The security guy had, had shut the door, and I'm like, open the door. And he said, I'm containing it. I'm gonna get us out of here. And they were going mad, proper mad. And I thought someone's gonna get hurt here. And we managed to get Dylan out. And he was going crazy outside. Uh, he, his boys were outside. He was going crazy. So when he was outside, he um, he had one of his boys with him. I don't know if I shared. Let's just say this, but yeah, I say it anyway. He had one of his boys with him. I can't remember the kid's name. I'll not even say his name. And he was like one of Dylan's soldiers. And so so he was uh, as he was there. He was um, uh, he was stood outside as I say, Dill, Dill. Do you want to get him? He went, Dylan's like, get him. I'm like, that deep voice, it was so mad. My man just turned around like a soldier. Boom, walking to the door. I don't know if he was kitted up or anything. He was walking to the door. I'm like, Dylan, Dylan, stop him, Dylan. So I, I went to the, the studio door. I stood in front of the studio door. My man's marching towards, Dylan, Dylan, call him out. And like, Dylan's looking, he was fuming, <laughs> fuming. And then he said the guy's name, yo. And my man stopped, looked around, he went, and he just turned around like a soldier, bump straight out. And I thought, hmm. what the fuck have I just seen here? And this this was proper bad. You know, when you're hearing people scream uh, because they're thinking, oh my God, what's going to what's gonna happen here? It was bad. Yeah. And so I just thought that was the best one. 
best one ever. And and if you could, if you could see the stuff that they did on on um, uh, the if you ever got the footage of what actually happened, you would think, what the fuck. Oh, I love that job. It's the best job ever. <laughs> and the thing is, you've got to have the right person doing it because if you don't, what happens is you, um, the fight is one, they probably not want to be as raw as what they could be. Mm. So therefore, they'll watch the language. They'll not be as emotional. They'll yeah. not be, um, they'll not be as, as what they, they could have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you want the raw emotion. You want them to be who they want to be. You don't want them to be watching the P's yeah. and watching the Q's. You want that natural raw instinct yeah, nah, and I think I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I get fighters I know them and they know I've boxed so and I ain't got no ego when I go in there you know what I mean so they can have a pop at me or whatever I don't give a shit <laughs> but I just want to get the best out of them yeah. and to me it's like great gig nah you're perfect great gig. You're, you're brilliant at it. so you're talking earlier about the recipe right or the ingredients that goes into the cake we've spoken about discipline persistence yeah. and a load of other qualities and traits which were really important to you becoming the champion longest reigning cruiserweight champion most defenses 13 right yeah. 13 with yeah. 13 different fighters yeah. which is outstanding and still that yeah. still stands today that record what of those qualities or those ingredients because we spoke again about it being transferable a lot of it yeah. what has what have you transferred like specifically to make you as good as you are as a pundit, as good as you are in media and as a TV personality? Like what, what have you transferred? What specific okay, ones? So as I said, I left school, I wasn't a brainiac. My, my reading was that the ability of what of a 13 year old. Mm. Uh, and even as an adult, when I have to read, read publicly, I'm like, okay, no, but you could still got that thing on your shoulder thinking shit, do I sound bad or whatever? And, and, um, and so what I found was if you just be yourself, if people like you, they like you. If you don't like you, they don't like you. Mm. I found that out in boxing when people chat shit about it. you. Either take it to heart or you think you don't know me personal, so I'm not taking it personal. So when I'm doing, when I'm in front of the camera, I'm just being myself. Uh, I have an opinion. If my opinion isn't of the masses, I get the I get the backlash. But I just think, well, that's my opinion. It's mm. create debate. You know, I'm not and I'm not saying these things to create debate because anything I say, I will give a justifiable argument why I said it. So, so some people like it, some people love it. Some people think like you're talking about, come and argue with me, let's have a conversation. You know, you've got to make people understand everybody's entitled to opinion. If I went on there and I just spoke and said what the things that people want to say, what makes me any different from any yeah. other fight that comes on there? So, so you've got to, it's, it's finding comfort in discomfort. So when you're in an un- uncomfortable situation, you've got to find comfort there and be able to perform there. Mm. And when you can perform there, that makes you different from anybody else. And, and was that discomfort when the record button went on and the camera was yeah. in your face like early? And that's early. what that discomfort is. When that camera's on, you know there's millions of people watching you, mm. judging you, looking at how you dress, how you, say, how you pronounce a word, how you, how, you, how, you, how you speak, you know, whatever. And they're judging you. That's nothing, you can't fight out of that. You've got to swallow it. You've got to, you've got to, if you're in a fight, in a ring, you can punch someone and get out of the way. Mm. But when someone's judging on what you say, your appearance and everything like that, you can't do nothing about that. Yeah. And it's very hard. It's like public speaking. You know, a lot of people will stand there and they think, shit, I can't public speak. But if it was one-on-one, you could have that conversation. So when you public speak, it's about owning your shit. So if you know what you're talking about and you know who you are, get up there and do it. It doesn't matter if you're, what, what they think of you. Your job is to, to deliver what you're delivering. That's your job. So I don't, my job isn't for you to like me, or like my shoes, or like, my, like, like how, sh- how my head's shaved. My job is to talk about what I talk about. Yeah. So then when you deliver that, people are warm to you because they think, you know what? Yeah, I get that. Mm. That inspires me that, because he reminds me of somebody that lives next door. Yeah. He reminds me of somebody I know. It's not scripted. It's not something, that, it's not something that's developed by a load of directors and producers or whatever. You've got to be able to be you and be comfortable in you. Own your shit. Yeah. I now know I'm good at what I do. So, and I'm, I'm comfortable with it. So when I get up and speak anywhere and do anything, I look at that young boy that was scared to speak in front of adults. I look at that young boy that remembers being pulled left to right by his mum and dad. And I think, look how you've changed. Yeah. Little kid from Sydney Road, Crook, Sheffield. Mm. All of a sudden you're able to talk anywhere to anybody about anything. And if I don't know something, I'm going to be embarrassed and try and bullshit my way through the conversation. I'm like, yo, 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 I don't understand, explain. I don't know what that word means. Because the masses will probably be the same. They're super intelligent. They'll think, oh my God, you idiot. But I'm, to- I'm real. 
So, so most people think, you know what? Like, how many times have you been in a conversation and uh, something's being said or a conversation's being had or words being used, you've no idea what they're talking about, yeah. but you bullshitted your way through it. Yeah. If I don't know, I'm going to say, stop, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and then and do it that way. I want to have a conversation. I want to be able to understand and converse and get it. That's how I learn. You know, and so now I understand when I was at school and I had a pen in my hand and it came to reading a book, that wasn't my skill. My skill is this. Yeah. And so, so there's many things that could change in schools and everything, how, how people talk uh, and how people are taught about educating people. Some people are good with their hands, some people are good with their mind, some people are good with their eye. You know, some people are good with that. But you've got to understand what someone is good at to bring the best out of them. Mm. And you've done such a great job because arguably you're more well-known, arguably, for being a TV pundit now than... Which makes me athlete. laugh. Which makes me laugh. I because I get a lot of kids today say, You used to box. Yeah. And I, went, I I actually think, yes, I've done yeah, my job. That's it, like the, you know, the Gary Lineker. Yeah. He's a TV presenter. Never right? was England captain. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why that's why I think when people say that to me, I think I like that. You've done And even when you get feedback well. saying, Nelson, what do you know? And I laugh and I think, I've done a good yeah. job here. <laughs> um, so so to me, it's not an insult, it's a positive. Um and, and I look at boxing today and I think, and I miss the camaraderie. I miss the banter in the gym. I miss being with the lads in the gym. I miss it like hell. Mm -hmm. But I understand where I'm in life. So it's the pyramid of life. Mm. So I've, I've done my stint. Now you've got to look back and admire and appreciate what's happening behind you. You can't dance in a party when you shouldn't be there. <laughs> you got my old man. I ain't going to dance in the party. Everything God, we've got some old man doing here. It's just appreciating the time, appreciating the moment, appreciating what you've done. Amazing. We do the same three questions at the end of every episode. Okay. Quick fire round. The first is, is there anything you've either discovered or come across or just this on the horizon that you're particularly excited about at the moment? Oh, um, yeah. Might be with it deep for people. Um, I, I met somebody and he has introduced me to spirituality. Huh. And I know some people are like, oh, here we go but it's about self, about understanding self, uh, having belief and confidence in self, but you've got to understand yourself. You've got to understand why things have happened, why think, why you do things, why you are the person you are. Um, so I wonder if it happens when you just get to a certain age. <laughs> but, but to me, I actually, I'm curious, and I'm not embarrassed about talking about that sort of stuff, whereas before, before you know, Brendan always said, things you avoid talking about publicly is sex politics and religion because it creates division mm. um i'm not embarrassed about actually saying you know I'm, I'm curious it's got my attention it's got my you know i, I get i get a lot of things i do I, I get it i understand why i do it i'm i'm sort of understanding why i was put on this earth you know it might be an old man conversation but to me i actually i'm always learning i'm always looking i'm good at human behavior i'm good at getting people i'm good at motivating people i know that's what i'm good at um and so my job is i've gone through all the experiences in my life for a reason when i became world champion i didn't think that's it i've done hmm. i thought is that it i want more than this which is why i managed to defend it so many times on beating because it wasn't enough some guys will become world champion and lose it after the first or second defense because they've reached their goal they think yes i've done it what do i use to motivate me now when I became world champion, I was nowhere near it. I thought, oh, is that it? I want more than this. I don't know what it is, but I want it. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a better understanding of self and and uh, it's just it's a great journey. Amazing. It's, it's so interesting because you know when you asked me before we click record, like what do you do? Actually, that's what I do. I help people to build self-awareness, understand the internal wiring, the narratives and who they've become because I think that's all there really is. We get distracted by ego and desire and what we're conditioned to believe is important in the early years of our life. And we chase that until a point where something happens and we realize we're dissatisfied chasing that thing. But I have to smuggle that message in and yeah. feel like a bit of a Trojan horse sometimes cause yeah, because people- Yeah, because you bring that conversation to someone and straight away they shut down. Yeah, yeah. And they go, here we go. Yeah. So, so, so you've got to set, put it in a language where people understand. Mm -hmm. Now I'll, I'll use, I, 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 don't, I don't know big words. I know I'll give you examples. I'll give examples of situations. I'll tell you a story. And when I tell you a story, I'll, I'll let you be able to visualize everything that's happening in that story. So when I'm telling the story, you get it. You think, I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm with it. So it's how you deliver it. 
And so, so that alone, and many of us think, many people think like that, but they're scared to speak publicly about mm. it. I mean, I, I'm annoyed it's taken us that long to get to this bit, but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave <laughs> So the second one is one habit you would uh, encourage all listeners to undertake. One habit. Train the mind. Train the mind. Amazing. And, and anything specific to train the mind? You've mentioned the fasting, you mentioned uh, reading. Little, little tricks to train your mind, fasting. Yeah. Um, if you're training, try and do it one day a week without music in your ears. Yeah, nice. You know, I loved listen, that example. Get your mind to listen to your body. Yeah. Final one. Imagine there's two versions of yourself. Take yourself back to a particularly challenging period in your life. There's one version who's gone on to achieve all the things that you did in both in the sport of boxing and in, uh, you know, with Sky and everything you've done in media. And there's another version that didn't go on to achieve all those things. What's the difference between the two? What's the key trait that separates the two? Well, those two people existed. <laughs> mm. um, and it's about self-belief. I didn't believe myself. And when I finally did believe myself, Brendan said, before he said, you don't have the, the, the confidence to match your ability. Now you have the confidence, you don't have the ability you had, but the ability you have is good enough to, to get you where you wanted to get, get mm. to. So it's about, again, it's about having the confidence to match your ability and believing in yourself. It's all that. That is everything. It's every, that, that is the difference between success and failure for me. And it's understanding that. So when I look back at the young version of me and I want to reach in the screen and slap the shit out of him <laughs> because he was so close to actually letting that penny drop. But then I would never change it because all the experiences I went through life to get to this point as maybe the person I am today. I could have won the title at 22 years old. I'd have lost it in my first defense because I was a boy in a man's body. I wasn't mature enough mm. to have that kind of responsibility. So I'd have messed up. So, so going through all the ups and downs, going to Germany for seven years and six, seven years and being on the road. And, and, and that gave me time to have confidence about who I am and thinking, decide whether or not I wanted it enough. So when I wanted it enough, nobody gave me the chance to do it. So therefore, then I had to fight for it. So when I got it, I was never going to leave it. So that, I'd have that conversation with myself saying, Johnny, listen to me, trust me. Brendan pleaded, he used every word, he swore, he, smoo he tried to smooch, he did everything to try and get that penny to drop. But once the penny dropped, I'm like, dickhead. Oh my <laughs> God, you idiot. That's how I deal with it. Johnny, thanks so much, mate. I've, I've loved it. Thank you. Pleasure being on, man. Thank you.